Hey there, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the Nature Journal Workshop. This is going to be really interesting today. We're going to be experimenting um, with a, uh, a, a completely new format here. And the uh, what, what we're going to be doing, I'm going to be introducing in just a moment, um, a dear um, friend of mine and nature journaling, or not nature journaling, but nature um, exploration companion. I'm going to be uh, introducing our, our special uh, guest lecturer today. We're going to be trying some uh, a, a different kind of format, and I think you're really going to like it. So today, rather than being a workshop and like, you know, here's how you draw a waterfall. I would do this, and then I would do this, and I do this. We'll have a few little tips and ideas in here. Um, but today, what we're going to be doing is meeting with a master naturalist, somebody who has devoted his life to a really deep and careful study of um, not just the literature of natural history, but is deeply immersed in it himself. And so from um, research and from personal experience um, has a deep understanding of the outdoors. Um, and um, so the fella I'm talking about, I'm gonna add him in here, at least on my screen, you're over there. Um, um, am I over on the on this side from you? You're on. Oh, I can't even point. It's you're over here, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I, 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 well, at least on my screen. Hey, that's this is David Lucas, and I'm really excited to introduce this community to David. Um, I uh, he and I have spent a, a lot of time. Um, rambling around in the Sierra Nevada. He was a principal consultant for me in the creation of the Laws Guide to the Sierra Nevada. Um, and uh, his version of, the, of the, the, the book is just, it's filled with notes and edits and things. Um, and he really helped me kind of craft that book. Um, so mad props to you uh, on that, David. Um, now, David, um, instead of living up near Yosemite, uh, David lives up in northern Washington and um, has also, uh, when, I, when I met you, you weren't, uh, you were not a videographer. Um, and, but that was something, we've all talked about growth mindset, how if you really get into something and you put the time in and you really work at it, you develop these skills. And uh, that is another area which David has explored to um, help him be able to, to communicate the, the beauty and the wonder of nature. And the, uh, so several things are gonna be happening here. Uh, one, we're gonna be to have just be in conversation with David Lucas. Number two, David is going to be showing us um, some of his photographs and videos that he's uh, been making of, of, of nature, natural moments. And something that he's starting to do, everybody, is to make videos specifically designed for us, for people who are doing nature journaling and can't get into all sorts of crazy wild areas. If you look at a lot of nature documentaries, it's like, look, look, it's a cheetah. And then like everybody's into this sort of fast cut, fast cut, show me something, then cut to the next scene, cut to the next scene. That's not the way we nature journalers operate. We were like, like, oh, let's look at that some more. Let's look at that some more. That's, it's not doing anything? Great. It's holding still. Let me kind of look at that some more. So kind of matching what we actually would see in nature, kind of giving us cuts of videos with sort of a long run on an interesting phenomenon. And then we can use those to nature journal from. So we can do our whole, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of process through these. And we're also going to have the videographer there with us who can, um, who we can pepper with questions. Um, the, uh, I uh, can uh, uh, consider David the sort of, he's my encyclopedia uh, uh, Lucas Tanicus. Um, if I've got a question about, you know, like, what do, you know, which sorts of species of phalaropes are going to be in the Bay Area at this time of year? Um, I consider David my natural history hotline, and I can call him up and sort of and pepper him with with questions. So we'll have an opportunity to do this too. And um, so, um, David, thank you so much for being with us. I'm really really excited to 
uh, that you can you can be here with us. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here and pleasure to meet everyone. I don't see everyone's faces, but I uh, see some familiar names and some of you may know may already know me. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you today. Jack and I have been talking about trying something new, doing like virtual nature walks, uh, where we can just use video to say, hey, we're going on a walk. Let's go explore this and then pause the camera and look at things closely. So today we just kind of want to do a little bit of a test run of that. Uh, video is pretty hard to show on Zoom. These are massive files. Uh, each 10 minute clip is about three gigabytes or more. Uh, so today we're just going to do mostly slides and see how that works. Um, but we're looking for feedback from folks, whether you want uh, still images or videos. And I love to share both. Uh, as Jack mentioned, I spent my whole life teaching people about the natural world. And with COVID, it got kind of hard to lead groups. So I really went deep into videography and figured that video is a great tool for capturing things in the natural world and showing them and telling the same stories what we do on a walk. So Jack and I have been thinking that would be great for this group as well. And I'm gonna share some of that with you today and share the place where I live because this is where I would be creating videos and images for the Nature Journaling Club. Um, so just by way of background, uh, I have spent most of my life leading nature programs and writing books, a couple books I have. Uh, one is You're Watching Wildlife, which is a pretty cool book. It's a guide to the top 200 wildlife spectacles in the world range week by week for the best time to see them. So kind of a cool fantasy book. And then I'll just mention one other that people might enjoy. Um, Language Making Nature, which is a book on how to create new words for speaking of the natural world. So it's a deep dive into how to play with words and take words apart and play with the pieces and basically craft words like clay into new shapes. So I really wanted to explore that through the lens of nature. People might, people might enjoy that book. Um, and there's a website with this book too, some background and some sample chapters. So, but Today, today, I just wanted to focus on introducing you to the area where I live in the world. So let me do a share screen here. And um, oops, let me do this way. Share screen. And tell me if that works. Is everyone seeing that okay? Um, yes, we see Nature Walks with David Lucas. Okay, my current slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so I live in a pretty unique corner of the world. So first I wanted to introduce it because it's a kind of wild area that a lot of people will never get to see. And so for me, it's a pleasure to be able to share this with people and being in this place gives me access to, I mean, the reason we moved here is so that I could be filming every day, incredible wildlife, incredible scenery to be able to present it to people and share it with people. Um, so kind of just going to a little nature walk here today. This is the landscape around where I live. It's a mix of shrub step, bitter bush, sage bush with ponderosa pine forest going straight up into the mountains. I'll show you some maps kind of where this area looks, but this is what it looks like to go on a nature walk here. Very beautiful place. Aspen Grove down there. Um, so I'm up in this corner up here. Can everyone see the cursor and see where I'm pointing here? Yeah, that shows up in red on our screen. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so the state of Washington, the Canadian border is right across the top here, uh, Puget Sound in Seattle. And then there's the massive crest of the, of the Cascade Range, and then all of the rain shadow desert area of eastern Washington over here. And I'm up here in this little finger up into the mountains on the far, far northern reaches of Canada. I'm going to show this map a couple of times to introduce you to the landscape and the general layout of things. You have the Puget Sound area here, you have the uh, Cascades right here, and then you have the east side here. And um, so we have a tremendous amount of water coming in off the coast over here, up to 250 inches of rain a year. So this is the west side, um, massive old growth forest, gigantic trees, and then bam, it hits the wall of the, of the Cascades here, which are these amazing, um, high peaks, lush, 250 inches of rain a year. This terrain has got incredible relief. So this is Sourdough Mountain. Some of you might know this. This is the spot where Gary Snyder, the poet, got his start working at a fire lookout here. Incredible hike, uh, 5,000 feet above the lake below, really giving you a view of this lush, verdant green carpet on the west side where the rains hit the mountains dump their snow on the high peaks and then move on past the rain shadow. 
So that's this west side here. And then we have the crest of the Cascades. We live up here in this area up here, and this is called the North Cascades. This is the, areas of, the area of greatest elevational gradient in the United States. All these mountains here are wilderness. We are surrounded by 2 million acres of continuous wilderness here. Um, just an incredible landscape. And look at what this looks like. So like I mentioned, this has the greatest elevation, elevational gradient in the United States. There's, it's 6,000 feet from these peaks to the valley bottoms, valley after valley after valley, 2 million acres of this kind of landscape. It's just an amazing place to be. This is what it looks like all around us in all directions. Um, and it's home to bears. Grizzly bears are supposed to be here. Um, lots of moose, lynx. Uh, there's a good population of lynx here, a good population of wolverine. Uh, Jack and I were talking, there's martens here. Just phenomenal wildlife. So these are the kind of things I'm going to be going out and looking for and wanting to share with you. And then um, past that, we have the rain shadow over here because all that snow and rain gets stopped in the mountains. And so we have the rolling hills. This is the Colorado Plateau here. This is what this landscape looks like. So we're in the rain shadow. A lot of these soils are rolling hills of uh, sands from the Ice Age floods. And it's a lot of basalt rim rock. And then right in between uh, the rain shadow and the high mountains is the foothill zone right in here, which is where I live. So here's kind of another peak of this foothill zone. See that mix of sh uh, shrub step habitat, bitter bush, sagebrush, mixed in with conifer forest and then the high mountains just beyond. This is the mix of where we live. And we are in this thin finger. See all this thin finger? So the yellow is the shrub step habitat, the sage bushy stuff. And it cuts into the deep into the wilderness, deep into the mountains here. So we're in a valley bottom in this long narrow finger that cuts right into the heart of these two million acres of wilderness. This is what it looks like from the air. Our little thin finger of a valley just terminating right here and going straight into this vast wilderness area. So these are the trails I'm going on hiking every day. Uh, just an amazing landscape. This is what it looks like in the summer. And it looks like such a beautiful idyllic landscape, uh, but just a note of realism, this is in a really extreme place. It looks beautiful, but we get five months of continuous snow, uh, frigid single digit temperatures every day in the winter, pretty much. Um, so for five months of the year, you can't even hike anywhere. Uh, it's the only, thing, only way to get around is skiing. And then uh, there's like six months of incredible wind. And then the nearest big town, nearest mid-sized town is 100 miles away where you have hospitals and mechanics and basic services. So this is really out there. So it looks idyllic, but it's a tough life. This is what winters look like. It's five months of continuous snow um, and frigid temperatures. And so it's, it's a tough life. But with that comes the melting of spring. So I'm going to start here. This it gets so fascinating when the snow and ice finally starts melting. I just get incredible clips of the just that melting edge as things begin to change. The season starts to come alive. It's so exciting. You can feel this in the air. And just the birds get really active, like this downy woodpecker. Beautiful little bird, little tiny bill. Look at that little tuft of feathers around its beak. Uh, I don't know if that's a natural color or if it's a staining that makes it kind of yellow, but isn't that cool? And it uh, looks just like a hairy woodpecker, but a hairy woodpecker would have a bill that would be like half again larger. And with a larger bill, it would be able to dig under deeper crevices and flake away bigger pieces of bark. Um, and this little guy here, or a little female maybe, um, would be able to get under smaller pieces of bark. One cool thing is, uh, I love to point this out on birds. See these white spots on this? Do you know what the function of the white spots on birds is? Jack, do you know what the white, function of white spots are? I uh, have no idea. They're on males and females, so it makes They me... both have it. Um, and um, it is something called uh, honest advertising because you can, you can, every bird can individually change its quality of its song, can change the quality of its postures, it can fluff itself up and like pretend like it's a big tough guy. Um, you know, it can change all that. But honest advertising, you cannot change no matter what. 
And so when they're attacked by feather mites, the feather mites eat the white feathers first because dark feathers have melanin pigments in it that are harder to chew up. And so the mites avoid colored feathers and they go for the white. So the quality of the white is an honest sign of how healthy you are and whether you're able to groom and keep the mites under control and whether you have a strong immune system that keeps the mites at bay. And so it's an honest signal of how healthy you are that you cannot fake this. And so a potential mate only has to look at your white spots to kind of get a quick gauge of like, do you comb your hair basically? Do you wear nice clothes? Kind of like that, right? So kind of a cool little thing. Oh, it's great. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of nugget that, oh, wait, wait, let's go back to that for, for a second. I'm thinking that yeah. what we might want to, if, if we can jump back to, yeah, here we go. Um, that what might be nice to do is just to, to kind of linger on something like this mm -hmm. and, and maybe uh, what I want to encourage people to, to try to do is, here is to, to, to make a sketch from what you see on the screen. And then to also add into that, uh, you know how we, we, we've talked about kind of sketch noting things, some notes about, um, you know, so the, the honest signaling. And let's just sort of use that as, as, a, as an excuse for, uh, for, for, for drawing a cool little woodpecker here. Yeah, look at that perfect body shape. It's, you can really see the profile nicely in this picture too. Yeah. The, uh, so on something like this, I would often start with just that angle right down the back, um, the back of the head and, and then down the back there and then block out the, the, the rest of the bird in front of that. I'm going to um, add in some written notes about what David said about those 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 mites and the honest signaling. That's the sort of thing when you hear it, you think to yourself, "Oh my gosh, that's that's amazing." I I'm totally going to remember that. But newsflash, our brains don't work that way. So <laughs> um, so if I want to remember that, I need to kind of get it down. I can write it, and that's okay. Um, if I can make um, you know, you know, you know, you know, draw a little picture of a, of a little mite next to your notes. That'll help it stick in there. Draw a picture, a little cartoon of one birding, of one bird kind of, uh, you know, looking at, at, at another one. Can you make a little thumbnail bird cartoon of this sort of assessment of your quality based on your <laughs> white spots? You know, how do you keep your white so white? And a good thing to do is to practice this whenever you see a bird with white spots. I mean, practice thinking this fact until you remember it. So for instance, you see it on spotted toeys. You see it on more birds than you realize once you start looking for white spots like this. That is, that's, that's beautiful. See, that's, that's one reason why I love as a naturalist hanging out in the field with David Lucas. This guy is full of this stuff, folks. So, uh, um, this is uh, just kind of a, an initial teaser taste. Well, I love these stories. Aren't they cool? They really change how we see the world. It, it really does. It really does. Yeah. That's um... looking, looking closely at this thing, if there's anything else we can see on this bird. So yeah, just as, as you- um, this, I think they're probably coming out because with the changing the seasons, the sap is rising probably the insects are starting to come awake. So it's like getting active and interested again and looking for things. Notice that that tail is flopped down right against mm -hmm. the edge of the branch there. So if this were not a woodpecker, that tail would be off the branch, but it's mm -hmm. actually doing a real woodpeckery thing here. Um, what, can, what are you noticing about the tail there? It looks very strong. Yeah. It looks sturdy. It's not bend, bending as it leverages the weight of the bird. I'm thinking the fulcrum point is all, that looks like a toe right there. You think so? I think so. Yeah. 
It seems like an awkward placement for a foot, but aren't they, uh, are they zygodactylous? Is it two toes, uh, three toes forward, one toe back? Oh, 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 I think on, on these guys, we've got uh, two forward, two back. Mm. And the, um, uh, so the, uh, so our, 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 our downy woodpeckers on a, on a different plan than the other woodpeckers? No, I don't know. All woodpeckers are going to be the same. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really. Well, should I move on? Um, so, we're going to move on. Uh, Nature moves quick. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in just a moment here. So, um, I've got some little notes. We'll be sharing some of these with each other. Um, And don't worry about having to make it right. Don't worry about making it uh, perfect. These are just tools for sticking things in your memory. And uh, okay. the more you do this, the faster you're going to get at it. Well, maybe I'll give you like 10 more seconds or something to move on. 10 seconds and we'll move on. Yeah, just I'll. I'll try to announce changing each slide. I just wanted to get to the maps and stuff quickly because I knew we weren't going to be sketching those. But now we can pause as much as we want and I'll let you know before I move on so you have time to get your final notes. So with the changing in spring, we see a variety of other birds, a couple of other birds. One of the things we have here is we have the highway going up over the cascades, but the highway is closed in the winter because of snow. But you can walk or ski up the road giving you access into the high mountains. So we went up one day and um, we didn't have to go up very high before we found these high country birds coming down because they had run out of their food. So if you know this bird is a Clark's nutcracker, it's in the pro and Jay family. Um, and it had come down probably because it had run out of cones in the high country. I had never seen them on Ponderosa pine. Um, eating these, these are small seeds. They're used to much bigger seeds, but I think it's better to have this food than nothing else. So they were working these ponderosa pine cones pretty hard and being very vocal about it. As you might know, they're a very vocal bird, like many jays are. Highly intelligent. Uh, just a little bit about their life history. They use this big, strong prying bill to pry open cones on conifers and eat the seeds but they collect about 98,000 seeds and bury them all over the landscape in caches of about 10 to 20 seeds per cache. So that's thousands and thousands of caches all over the landscape. And they put them on different kinds of slopes at different elevations. So it depends on where the snow is and how quickly the snow melts. They always have access to some caches and they can find all of them even several years later, they can find these caches. And even more incredible is they can, uh, they can dig down to get to the caches under several feet of snow, which means they're not memorizing landmarks um, or they're using a different kind of landmark. So they're not like, oh, there's a boulder there and there's a stick there. I'm gonna dig right there in between them. Everything's covered under several feet of snow. <coughs> How do they do that? That's incredible. And not only do they dig down through several feet of snow, but if there's several feet of snow in the ground, they have to come in at an angle so the snow doesn't collapse on them. <coughs> Excuse me. And they calculate the angle of that tunnel into the snow to the ground to reach the seeds. Really incredible. So, so you're saying that they, these guys can dig two feet down under the snow <laughs> at an angle, targeting a specific place task. where they buried 10 seeds. Yeah a year ago <coughs> or two years ago even amazing <clears throat> so that's so this that that's amazing amazing spatial memory oh. yeah the um the people that do research on these birds have done some really <laughs> twisted experiments on their graduate students testing their graduate students' memory capacity against these birds' memory capacity, and the birds always win. <laughs> the graduate <laughs> students can't even keep up with the memory of these birds. So they obviously have a huge hippocampus, that portion of the brain devoted to spatial memory. Hmm. And if you are interested in this topic, there is a 
fascinating book called Made for Each Other by Ro Richard Lanner. Is it Richard Lanner? I think it's Richard Lanner, L-A-N-N-E-R, going into this entire story of their life history. And there's so much more than that. I mean, and one thing that's fascinating, so if they're burying thousands of caches all over the landscape, they're burying way more than they need to eat. And there's also the chance that the bird dies from natural causes or over the course of the winter. So all those unused caches sprout and turn into new trees. And scientists guess that, um, estimate that all of the subalpine forests of the Northern hemisphere have been planted by nutcrackers. Say because that again. All of the subalpine forests of the Northern hemisphere have been planted by nutcrackers. Because the seeds have co-evolved with these birds. So the seeds will sit in the cones and rot unless they're harvested by these birds. And the birds don't just drop the seeds on the ground, they plant them at the exact depth needed for the little root to germinate and start turning into a new tree. So it's deep enough that it's not too deep and it's shallow enough, or it's shallow enough that it's not too deep and it's deep enough that it doesn't get found by rodents. So the only way these seeds can germinate is when they're planted by nutcrackers. So all of the forests have been basically planted intentionally by these birds. It's really an incredible story. And I love that book. That's crazy. Hey, folks, yeah. do you see why I wanted to bring David on and introduce him to this community? <laughs> this, if you go on a walk in the woods with David, it's like this nonstop. And you also see that he's got that same kind of curiosity that we try to cultivate. Um, he's got it in spades and his just joyful celebration of this sort of comes out in in, in every moment with him out there. So um, That's cool. this well, is, thanks, Jack. Oh, hey man, I, I'm just so happy this crew, this posse is having a chance to, um, to, 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 to meet some Lucas here. Um, we have a couple of questions actually, um, because people are enjoying this. Um, so first we were wondering, what's the name of this bird again? What kind of nutcracker again? Uh, it looks like David is currently frozen. Um, uh -oh. I guess one of the disadvantages of, of being so far uh, in such a remote area that you, every once in a while I get a, 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 a bad signal. Nice. This is a Clark's nutcracker. Clark's nutcracker, okay. Named after uh, Clark from the Lewis and Clark expedition. Cool. And and then the other question was, all sub, um, subalpine forests are all subalpine pine forests? Um, subalpine. Uh, he said, uh, he said, northern hemisphere subalpine forests. Wow, that's neat. Northern hemisphere subalpine forests. Um, yeah, so David may be trying to um, to, to join us back here in a moment. Um, so we'll, I think that he had to drop out because of his, can, oh, look, there he is. There's David, David. Um, you, sorry, okay, now oh, you should be here. Back. Okay. Sorry about that. No, I'm not here in the middle of nowhere, so my, <laughs> so let's see if this goes back to my, so, so David, the question the folks were asking. Yeah, sorry, um, I missed that. Is, am I back on this on the sharing screen here? Um, you will be in a moment. Yes, we have okay. we have Nutcracker. Okay, thank you. Okay, question. Sorry about that. Um, I'm out here in the middle of the wilderness, so the signal is not always perfect. Um, so people were wondering, you know, is that um, all subalpine pine forests, or is that all subalpine forests? Um, well, the uh, that's uh, that's a great question. Uh, so I'm getting this out of Lanner's book, and he just says subalpine forest. But let's think about that more carefully. So there are trees like here. We have larch uh, in the mountains, and I don't think they're harvesting larch seeds. And there's hemlocks, and I don't think they're harvesting hemlock seeds. So. I think that that, might, that question might require more digging. Like so, there's no value to them to harvest tiny, tiny little hemlock seeds and bury them. So, uh, 
By the way, everybody, I want to point out something that David just did um, that you will also see is just a fundamental part of the way he rolls. Um, he said that would uh, require more digging. If David doesn't know the answer to it, I know some naturalists who they want to impress everybody with how much they know, and they will make stuff up when they're not sure. I have never seen that in David Lucas. So, um, so mad pro props for saying, oh, that's, that's because you're not my wife. <laughs> uh, on, one of my, on one of my first walks with her, I told her that ticks pull back grass stems and then launch themselves at you as you walk by. And she believed me and told a bunch of other people. And so. <laughs> oh, oh, but, but, but that was, that was in, in, in intentional shenanigans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to be careful. Anyway, uh, one other thing, uh, we'll move on because we've been on this one for a while. But I was going to point out the scientific name of this bird is Gymno rhynchos. Gymno means naked, like a gymnasium, um, and rhynchos is beak. So it's digging its face into these pitchy cones all the time. So it can't have feathers around its nostrils and face like a lot of other birds. So its scientific name is naked beak. Because hmm. uh, otherwise your faces would end up a massive pitch. So, well, let me move on. Is that, I think people had a long time with this one. And one other cool bird that we saw, I mentioned this, you see this in the winter. I was surprised how many goshawks we saw. This is a really, I mean, I, in my whole life, I've only seen, I don't think I've ever really seen one close up and seen them flying way off in the distance of hawk migration or something. But to see them on a regular basis close up, really cool to get a sense of these really dramatic, fierce hunters of forest. This is an acipiter. It's in the same group as sharp -shinned hawks and Cooper's hawks, but it's a, the massive cousin of those the feared bird of the forest. When this flies through the forest, the poor little Douglas squirrels scream like crazy, like, here comes, watch out, watch out, here comes the goshawk. They're all freaked out. And as long as it's in the area, it stays freaked out. Look at that red eye. I mean, we've seen that in a few other birds too, right? Um, like towhees, for instance, you see it in towhees. I don't know why they have these fierce red eyes, but isn't that beautiful? It's gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. And that's, that, and that's an age indicator, isn't it? So what? It's an age indicator. Oh, it would be, yes. Uh, yeah, it's a sign of an adult. That's a good point, exactly. Uh, but why? I mean, it's some sort of signaling that they do. <clears throat> uh, and here it is in an aspen grove, just as it's starting to leaf out. This is the day I was out. This is the first day I saw buds starting to come out on the trees. Um, but what a rare and magnificent look at this bird. And actually, I was pretty close to this bird. It was in the creek bathing in the snow. And it flew up in front of me, landed on this branch, was shaking the water off its feathers and preening itself and looking around. And so I was able to spend quite a bit of time with it. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah. Like compared to the woodpecker, see the tails hanging down for balance here rather than being pushed up against the... Uh, so in the hawks, the ones with the long tails are the ones that hunt dynamically in the forest, chasing birds. This is their rudder that they steer with. Wings are short relative for hawks. So a red tail would be the tip of the wings and the tip of the tail would be almost exactly the same. Look at the big disparity here between the long, long tail for steering as it goes through the trees in the forest and then short wings so it can flap quickly and not clip branches as it zigzags through the branches chasing down this poor prey. Mm. Yeah, so I, goose hawk from the word goose means a goose hawk. Yeah, I remember reading something about that just that there's with all the the alarm calls when the alarm calls start kind of going around these things. Yeah. Um, it there is this wave of alarm calls that is happening ahead of the goshawk as it's flying through the forest and so as it's as it's blasting around the this this warning system from all the birds and the squirrels in the forest is going out ahead of it and so everybody's hiding it from it and part of what it's trying to do 
is to kind of get around and get ahead of or get outside of this sort of bubble of warning noises that it is around. So if you want to, to hunt effectively, you have to um, be really sneaky and, sh and, and snake your way out of this bubble of warning calls around you. Or move ahead of it. Yeah, Very I think that, that, that's a, a kind of sort of it's a fun visual to sort of think. Yeah, that's a great. I love that, Jack. That's fantastic. And what's really interesting, so I got to experience that here, is how long those poor squirrels will just sit there. It's like a little trigger gets turned on, and they don't know how to turn it off. They're just like, G -g 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 -g, and they just keep going and going and going. It's like, shut up, squirrels. The bird's not doing anything, you know. But they would. So yeah, that trigger is really intense for these little birds. <clears throat> I mean, for the little squirrels. And it must be the specialty item this bird focuses on or something. So everyone ready? You can move on. We haven't even gotten to the flowers yet. This, I'm just like, this is a prelude to the flowers in springtime. <laughs> I'm kind of leading on a, uh, in the future, if we do this, we would do a, a, a focused walk. We would go out for a single virtual nature walk. But I'm trying, since I'm introducing everything, I want to just kind of give you a, a sweep of the seasons and a sense of, Kind of the range of places and things that we see here. I'm going to move on and see what's next. Oh, with the awakening of the seasons, uh, even with the snow covering the ground, wherever there was a little patch of bare ground, the butterflies started coming out in like March. And it was so amazing to see a patch of a single little patch of bare soil with a dozens of butterflies kind of using that as our spot to sit and warm up and then do forays back and forth out over the snow or go into little seats that were coming down the hillside. A uh, really common one was this, uh, two, two really common ones I'm going to show you here. This one is the morning cloak. And are, are these one of the, the hibernating um, is, butterflies? Yes, that's one of the first ones out. So they don't have to pupate and hatch out of a cocoon, they've already overwintered as adults. And it's amazing the shape that this butterfly is in, given that it just spent five months in deep freeze, locked into some little crevice in the bark somewhere or some little cavity in a tree, <clears throat> waiting for the days to warm up enough. Um, and they come out and they're ready to go right away. <clears throat> so the, 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 they go down in little tree cavities and things? Yeah, any kind of little cavity they can find. <clears throat> but they must have glycerol in their blood to keep from freezing. I mean, given how low the temperatures are, even if you're in a cavity, it's still going to go below freezing, I would think. Mm -hmm. Look at the iridescence here is in this spot here. Oh, let me uh, actually. Now that I think about it, there's a great description of these colors while you're sketching. I'll read. This is from Vladimir Nabokov. Wrote a great description. He's a, a true poet of butterflies. And I thought this was such an interesting way of saying it. Let's see. So Nabokov calls this velvety black. Yes, that looks velvety black. Um, with a warm tint of ripe plum through which <laughs> a row of cornflower azure grains. That's a nice description. What a that way to talk about it. What, what book is that from? This is from an absolutely delightful book from my friend Robert Michael Pyle called The Butterflies of Cascadia. And Robert Michael Pyle has written oh, a couple dozen nature books renowned nature writer, but his passion is butterflies. And so he writes about butterflies with the voice of a poet also. And Nabokov is his hero for that. So in, in this uh, group, we've people are also really taking a close look at how to use language in richer and more meaningful ways. Uh, you had, you did an interview with, or a talk with uh, Rebecca. I haven't yet. You we haven't yet. Right. About it. I, I, we got to get you two uh, to, to play together. She's uh, developing some little workshops for us to, um, to to help us kind of bump up our game with how we use words in our nature journals. 
Well, I'm fascinated by our language and our words. And one of the things I, one of the reasons why I wrote my book, Language Making Nature, is that if you look at the language we use to describe nature, like you could pull out Henry David Thoreau from 150 years ago, and the language is basically the same after 150 years. People aren't playing with the language of nature in the way that I think they could. And I, I contrast that with like, what, what, what excites kids these days? Like hip hop and like the slang. And I mean, that's what gets kids engaged. So maybe having the language of nature just get free form and creative and wildly playful might get kids more excited about it than if it's the same language after 150 years. It's beautiful language. I love those old nature books. I love the language, but it doesn't feel like it has that same dynamic, playful energy that you could do if you were like working with clay or art or something. I want to play with words and have them come alive again. So, you know. So if, if you were to say play with, with, with words here, looking at this phenomenon that we have in front of us, um, what, what, would that, what would that look like? Well, I don't know. I mean, you could come up with new, new names for the colors new ways of how it how it touches your senses or something i mean uh i think that that i love that description from nabokov i think that does a pretty good job of it you don't have to create new words but just use words in playful new ways so you know that this corn flower as your description is pretty beautiful way of saying something that i would never in a million years think about calling this butterfly bat Um, oh, somebody was asking, what's the name of that butterfly again? This one here? Morning cloak, like to be in mourning. So it's the thought is that it's like a draping of a hood, like if you're in mourning. And then I was reading that in the Civil War, they used this imagery of like a widow in mourning from her husband soldier being killed in the war. But then there's a glimmer of hope underneath around the edges, kind of like peeking out like Yes, you mourn for a while, but then you begin lifting the cloak and just the glimmer of life coming back in around the edges. And I thought that was kind of beautiful and also really meaningful in light of the Civil War. That, that's a beautiful metaphor. I, well, that is a beautiful metaphor. Another, another butterfly have, that appeared doing the same exact thing. These two were together. This is a hoary comma. Hoary, like, a, uh, like hoarfrost, H-O-A-R. Why? It's one of the other butterflies that overwinters as an adult. And look how tattered it is, but that tatteredness is also part of its look. This is one of the cryptic ones. It'll flash its wings open like that. Beautiful, intense orange. When it closes its wings, it looks exactly like a leaf. It looks like a tattered, lichen-covered leaf. And you, you, you could point it out to someone and they can't even see it because it's so cryptic. And then bam, it flashes its wings open really flamboyant, takes off. Yeah, so it makes me think about kind of, you know, the, the predator gets a search image. Yes. I'm going after the orange butterfly, the orange butterfly, the orange butterfly. I'm gonna yeah, get yeah. that orange butterfly and then all you have to do is close up your wings. Yep. You're not now looking for the camouflage butterfly. Your brain is now tracking along with, where's the orange, where's this, where's the orange butterfly already? No, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, and the animal probably, the predator probably isn't thinking like, oh, it's hiding. It's probably like, oh, it disappeared, went into another dimension or something. Mm -hmm. If I can get you to track the orange and I can turn the orange off at will. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. That's a great trick. And also with the morning cloak that we just looked at, when they um, take off, they, they, they clap their wings loudly together. And so that sudden noise and then the butterfly taking off is thought to also startle predators. So a predator might be going for it and just the moment it gets to it, this loud clap and then the butterfly flees and the predator is like, doesn't know what to do with that. So that's the thought of what, why the morning cloaks also add in that auditory signal as part of their escape mechanism. Oh, I've never heard that. Or I've never sort of thought of listening to the sound of mm -hmm. two wings flapping. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you like 10 seconds to move on to the next one. Give you time for a quick sketch. 
And I think all of these images are going to be available later, right? In a recorded version. Mm -hmm. So people could return to them also. And then um, during this presentation, I have a couple of videos, and those videos are on YouTube. I, I've been posting them as 10 minute nature scapes, I'm calling them. And I'll just keep posting them under that. So these same videos I have in here also are on 10 minute nature scapes. Um, so if, if people want to find those nature scapes, we would go to YouTube and type in David Lucas. David Lucas with a K or just 10 minute nature scapes. Okay. If you subscribe, you'll just keep tracking because I'm going to post quite a few of them. So. Um, and I really want to find out from people what you think of those, what kind of images are helpful for you, what you like to sketch. So any feedback would be really appreciated because that's that will help me refine the craft of making these videos for people. And look at this beautiful common garter snake. I think I saw this on the day it came out of hibernation. You know, so there's still snow around. It's, it was in a, a pile of granite rocks uh, coming out, just sticking its face out into the new sun. And I think probably coming out for the first warm day and checking things out, coming out of hibernation. So it's kind of a just, this image seems to capture that. Like it's just checking out spring again for the first time. Look at that beautiful face and those colors of this amazing snake. Showing it moment. Imagine being there you know, like the butterfly or the snake, not able to create your own body heat and just yeah. waiting for the world, the thermal environment around you to make it possible for mm -hmm. you to get out there and sort of start your start your year again. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, there's a whole elaborate story about these and eating newts, but um, I don't remember all the details of it exactly, but I know that rough skin newts have enough venom to kill like 20,000 mice, I think it is. And yet these garter snakes neutralize that venom toxin. It's a toxin so they can eat them. Yeah, it's, it's tetrodotoxin, the same thing that is in fugu, the, the, uh, puffer. the yeah, the puffer fish. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, crazy crazy deadly substance these guys can these so these guys can chug newts they can yep <laughs> i think we have newts here we don't have many snakes around here so it's kind of nice to see a snake love that those colors <clears throat> and uh it's a complicated story let's see do you know this one jack that in order to break down the toxins, not all the snakes will do that. It's a choice you have to make. Because if you break down the toxins, you have to, and so that opens up a food source that wouldn't be available to you otherwise, a common food source. But in order to do that, they have to have a different sodium channel across their membranes, which means that they're able to break down the toxin, but it's a slower sodium channel, which means that they're sluggish and they're not able to avoid predators themselves. So that seems to be the choice. It's two different me metabolic pathways you get to choose. One lets you eat newts and detoxify them, but means you're vulnerable to predators. Or the other one is you get to be fast and lively, but you can't eat newts. And it all has to do with sodium um, channels across membranes and on a cellular level. It's a pretty complicated story. Oh, man. So mad props to whoever figured that out. <laughs> No kidding. Who? Why would you look for that? Yeah. yeah like, what, what's going to like? Well, let, let's let's look at the um, how how these things sort of process sodium, and and then and then and then but then that's going to have all of these crazy biological implications. Yes. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. And why in the heck did news have that much toxin too? That's crazy, crazy, crazy. So yeah, you don't want to handle newts or you don't want to threaten newts. So, <clears throat> so let me move on, see if we can see what else is happening in the spring here. I'm going to move on to the next image. Oh, so as the snow is melting off the ground, the ground is just, you can see just a few little sprigs of grass coming up. 
these things were everywhere. Any idea what these are? I never really was able to figure this out. An expert told me that they're slime molds, but even they weren't really sure what kind they were or what was going on. So these are the size of little BBs growing all over decaying grass stems from the previous year that have been buried under snow. And these things were everywhere. And then these little BBs got older and then they kind of cracked and split open and all these black, brownish black spores would come out of them. I don't know what this life cycle is or what this is. This is like just, and I've never got a good answer. So one of those great mysteries of the natural world we run into sometimes is these really conspicuous diagnostic things that you can never figure out exactly what's going on. And I don't even know how to explain the life cycle of slime molds. Uh, it's so complicated. But, and it's, it's also amazing that slime molds, they, they can scoot around with um, their, their cells being completely undifferentiated. Ooh. And so there's sort of this sort of mass of, of cells moving as a unit, sort of behaving as kind of a team amoeba, um, mm -hmm. kind of putting themselves on top of stuff that they can digest. But then at some point, they differentiate. Some of those cells turn into outside skin parts and others for spores that'll be inside. Wow. And they, so they completely change their, their, their form and morph. So if the, the, there's, there's a little kind of, there's a narrow kind of humidity window, I think, where it's, it's cool to kind of slosh around and be a motile slime mold. But when that game is That's up, so. <clears throat> um, it's, it's time to kind of, uh, time to spore out. Mm -hmm. um, Very cool. And then I'll move on. Oh, man. Spring starting to happen. And look at these little seeds. Desert parsley seeds of lamation. Whoa. Beautiful colors on these seeds. And then it looks like each one is leaving behind. It's fascinating that the root is in the ground and the seed stays at the top of the, of the new leaves. I guess that's the way seeds go. But um, it looks like there's two leaves per seed. Could, could those be the, the cotyledons? Yeah. Sort of, so I wonder if that, is that like then this, the coat, the coat of the seed being pushed off, mm -hmm. the germ of the seed perhaps staying in the ground there. In the ground, yep. So it must have been in this part of it and then it just pushes it out. But oh. I just love how these ended up at the top like this, this little nested forest of seeds. Oh, that's neat. And then I'm going to They're move on to a, another desert parsley. So these are desert parsleys in the Lomatium. Um, and Lomatium is a word for the winged seed. So there's a little wing around the seed. So Loma means wing. And so there's like a little winged seed here. And then here's a different species that's really common here. And look at that beautiful structure. It's just unfurled. Yes. Oh. This is a single plant, but, and oh, oh, look, cool. There's a little mite right there. You see the little mite? We were talking about a mite earlier. There's a little <laughs> red mite. Isn't that cool? <laughs> uh, but look at the architecture of how those leaves are furled up and then they're gonna splay out. This is the fern leaf desert parsley, Lamatium dissectum. These end up quite tall and carpeting entire hillsides. I'll show you that in the next slide. Well, we're almost out of our time here, and I wonder if maybe it might be good just to. I, I'm thinking that what we need to uh, here, here's what what I'm uh, what I'd love to do is I, maybe we kind of pull this group. Um, for for me, I'm fi finding it's totally fun just to kind of geek out on natural history stories and have a chance to kind of be journaling and drawing at the same time. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we kind of want to have a forum for, I, I, I don't want to, to, to I know you've got a, a full plate, but I'd love to kind of pull this group and see if it would be fun for folks to kind of just, you know, uh, to, to, to pick a few of these, um, these, these pictures and kind of on a 
regular or semi-regular basis kind of meet and just geek out on you're 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 finding the phenomena for us mm -hmm. um, yes, the raw material for sketching some really interesting things so we can do we this even get to the flowers yet <laughs> yeah so the uh so you've got a lot more material than this yeah um, well, just just for this presentation alone, not to mention what I'm getting every day when I go out. Um, so this is the kind of, but this is the kind of stuff I'd love to share with people and would love to share with this group. Um, especially if we, if it can be discussion like this, that's a lot more fun for me, and a, a discussion and um, a chance to sketch and journal about these images. This is I kind of have this rare place to be. These rare rare animals and plants to see that people don't normally get to see. So I'd love to share them with folks. Huh. Look, I just noticed there's another mite on there too. Where's, where's your second mite? Right here. Oh yeah. Out of focus. Oh, and there's another one there. So about how big would this whole nugget be? Now that's a great question. Um, let's see, so it's about four inches high. It's quite, it's quite large. So this is uh, like a skinny onion. The, this, this part is like a skinny onion. So it's quite large. It's bigger than you expect. I mean, these are grass stems coming up here. And what lomation was this? Dissectum, referring to the fern-like dissected leaves. And these end up being about Oh, three to four feet tall. I mean, this is a this is a really robust plant. But look at uh, the, look at the angle of those veins on that um, sheath. Oh, isn't that cool? Yeah, that that that, that that's as, as far as it, a, an artist is concerned, that's total gold for us because we just follow those lines and it sort of helps describe this sort of rounding the, the, the shape of that. We call those cross contour lines. And this one has the cross contour lines built into the subject. It's nice that they're kind of straight almost here, but, but showing the curve here, really interesting. I guess, cause it's curving here as the leaves push out on that side. Mm. So it's, you know. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, well, if you need to, we should wrap this up, so. Uh, I just was thrilled to be here and thrilled to share with people. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being part of this with us. Uh, David, what I'd love to do here is to kind of open this up to um, community conversation. Um, so people are now able to unmute themselves. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to... Uh, and I, I would love to hear from, uh, love to, first of all, to see any uh, journal pages that people created during this. Yeah. Um, and um, also hear from people, you know, thoughts about with, with this uh, kind of getting together and having uh, these uh, nature geek outs like this, would that be something that people would be into doing together? Um, let me... Um, I'm going to start with Heather, and um, Heather, you're live with David Lucas. Oh, I love seeing the sketches. Thank you, David. This was wonderful. You, different Heather. Uh, <laughs> oh, different Heather. Sorry. No, 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 no. Heather, Heather, Heather. You're you're right. No, uh, uh, Heather uh, Kinch uh, Studio. Um, yes, you're yes. you're you're live. Yes, yes. Am I live now? Yes, yes. you are. Uh, David, this was wonderful. I love doing this page. Beautiful. And uh, Jack, the page before was your instruction on butterflies. So <laughs> help me put did, butterflies didn't. in today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really fun. So and, and also, I want people to notice, is that a colored pencil you're using to get those colors in there? Yeah, I use Coley Race when I'm doing these uh, books. Yep. 
So colorized pencils on toned paper that allows Heather to get um, fast colors and also be able to pop the whites in. Yeah, the white is uh, a, a uh, Prismacolor. Right, yeah, Prismacolor makes a very nice um, opaque one. And also notice the little kind of frames around, like around the Clark's Nutcracker one, there's a little kind of, um, almost a little voice box, a little um, voice window kind of connecting those notes with the bird. That's a very useful visual tool to connect those notes in with what you're seeing. Thank you very much. I would love to do another one of these. Thank Fantastic. you, Heather. Uh, Heather, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, let's take a look here. Um, Sandra, uh, good to, to see you. Let's see what um, is going on in your <laughs> journal. Pleasure to well, meet this, you. This Pleasure. was exciting. I'm sorry. No, 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 please go. Nice. This, all this um, fast sketching, I, I kind of got behind and then I realized what was going on. <laughs> so I tried to catch up and um, this, this was great. This was a, a most wonderful hour. So I do hmm. hope we can do something like this again. Oh, fantastic. Um, and are you, are you adding watercolor on your page also? I started out with the blue ballpoint pen, and then I realized I needed some color. So I had very <clears throat> limited color. Some is from pencil and a little bit of wash. Mm -hmm. Sandra, that's really fun. Oh, uh, the, the, the Lomation dissectum, that last thing, the four inch thing down there, yeah. you really yeah. kind of, you get a sense of the, the roundness and the paperiness of that. I like how the, the notice that on Sandra's uh, watercolor there, um, this is watercolor, right? It is, um, and pencil. Yeah, that there's just a, a little bit of the kind of that pale color showing through, sort of giving you a little bit of that sort of a sense of the paperiness of that mm -hmm. different textures. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I would love to do a draw, a proper drawing of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Well, I think the image will be available, right? Um, yes, um, and, and, and both. So, and what we um, what we might what we should talk about, David, is kind of getting a place for you to regularly share um, those uh, sort of photographic inspiration, um, as well as those videos. Right. Yeah. I, one question I'm going to have is: is did we spend enough time? on each image for people or is that too much? Or I guess there's always, people would always want more time, but. Well, we got them on the page. You got them on the page, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you, Sandra. Thank, thank you so you. much. Um, so I would like to introduce you to Rebecca Rolnick, who is the person who is uh, really helping this community start to use words in more um, uh, nuanced and, and interesting ways. Um, uh, Rebecca, you're live with David Lucas. Hi. So first, here's Rebecca. my nature journal from today. Um, I'm here with Downy Woodpecker. And then I wrote down some of the, I just did a quick sketch of the um, nutcracker and wrote some of the facts about it. And from this page, I'm really happy with how the butterfly sketch turned out. I don't um, usually get to see butterflies that close up or sit still for a long time. So that was really, really cool to get to see the butterfly. I noticed um, near here, it looks kind of hairy on the edges of the wings. So that was really interesting. And just seeing the shape of the body of the butterfly. Um, is not something I'm very familiar with up close. Um, and I also started thinking, um, so I've uh, had a conversation with David before um, and we haven't, we, there's nothing on the schedule yet, but we've talked about the possibility of having a workshop about his book 
language making nature on the writing workshop Wednesdays, which I host once a week. Um, what I've I've read his book and it's really fascinating. I I think it would be a lot of fun to play with the words. Um, honestly, I could imagine a whole series of workshops based on the book. Um, and now I'm also thinking maybe we could use these videos in the writing workshop too, um, not to sketch it, but to think about using words in our nature journals and practice doing that in real time. That's great. Which I think would be a lot of fun. Yeah, interesting idea. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to, to uh, I want you, you, the two of you to, to talk because the, the potential for collaboration here is, is exquisite. Um, thank you. And, uh, and Rebecca, it's fun to, to see those, those butterflies. It, it's neat to kind of see that thing up so close. Um, also, if you get a pair of those Pentax close focus binoculars, you can then geek out on butterflies um, with that level of, of, of resolution. Uh, something to, to consider. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I think you guys definitely got to be in touch. Um, I am now jumping back to, um, so I would like to um, introduce you to Volters, um, who is uh, uh, tuning in from Latvia. Um, Volters, you are live with David Lucas. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I had two questions. Uh, first one, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't drawing at the very beginning. So where is your location that you go out? Was it Colorado? No, great question. I am in Northern Washington uh, in yeah. the North Cascades, North Cascades mountain range on the Canadian oh. border. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the second question was, do you ever, uh, when you're going out, do you ever also bring a, a journal or a notebook to take notes or you do only photographs? And if you do notes, how does that affect your work? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. And it brings up a really fascinating point that I'd love to share with this group. So I spent my life as a writer. I've written hundreds of articles and dozens of books I've contributed to or written. Um, and so my entire life, I've gone out with a little pocket notebook and I'm taking notes in the field as I go, or jotting down observations, describing things. And I thought that when I started doing video that I could take a camera out and I could set it up and I could film something. And while the camera was rolling, I could be taking notes in my notebook. But I discovered it's two separate parts of your brain and they don't really meet easily, which really surprised me. I thought I could do everything, but I can't really. When I have the camera in hand and I'm looking for things visually and photographing or doing videos, my brain is not thinking about words and writing at all. And even if I set up the camera and it's rolling on its own, I'm filming a flower or an insect or an animal, and I'm just sitting there watching and waiting, I don't think about pulling out my notebook and writing. It's my brain isn't there at all. I'm totally focused on the visual part of the world and I'm watching intently and watching the changing visual aspect of the landscape. And I don't, I haven't taken any notes at all since I've done film, which is so weird. And I thought that you could do both. And maybe that's a tool that I'll learn over time, but at the moment it's two separate things. So it's a great question. So if I don't have the camera, I have my notebook and I'm capturing everything in words and writing. Mm. Um, so maybe it's just a human desire to capture and, and express how we're connect, engaging with the world that's going on. And we do one or the other, and it doesn't matter what it is. We just want to be out capturing nature. Yeah. Right? We all love or see, yeah. preserve it. And if it's, we're drawing it or sketching it or filming it or writing it, it's, it's okay just that we're doing one of them. We don't have to do all of them. So thank you for yeah. that excellent question. That brings up a really important point that I'm finding myself yeah. thinking about right now and wondering why that is, what's going on in my brain. Thank you very yeah. much. For yeah. Uh, yeah, Latvia from Latvia. Uh, cool. I had, I, at one point I was also doing like uh, 
wildlife photography and nature journaling like both at the same time and I'm, I sometimes dig like, did it like I took a photograph of a bird and then kind of uh, it flew away and then kind of just uh, sketched it fast from the photograph but I found that those two things kind don't go together because I was when uh, looking through a lens, I was always looking for the composition to be right, for the light yes. to be right, but sure. I was not registering any behavior of the bird. Yes. And I found that uh, with the journal, I'm really kind of more not looking at the light and like the composition or anything, and just looking how it looks like and its uh, behavior down. So those are the important things now. Thank you so, for those fantastic uh, yeah. observations. That's really interesting. Yeah. And Thank you. could I do a quick share? I just wanted about the butterflies also. I, Jack, you had the class uh, uh, on butterflies. And now I was doing uh, just some small sketches. This is not from today, but just from the meadow that we have in my uh, front mm -hmm. yard and was just doing uh, some non-color uh, noting those, about those the butterflies. Really to sort of taking advantage of the strategy of focusing on that one side and yeah. taking advantage of the bilaterally symmetrical. Yeah, it's just uh, because, you know, it, it flies uh, flies away past. So it's the both uh, sides are symmetrical. So there's no need to uh, kind of put in detail and uh, anything on the on the both sides of it and then also was doing this been going a lot to the meadows lately and of course some uh, red back trikes oh, are coming that's... back and some cows well you know meadow stuff yeah uh, sh show just uh, uh, flash David some of your other ornithological observations uh, some of your bird notes. I, I'd, I'd love him to just take a peek uh, through the pages of the journal there. Okay. I like just look through the journal. Well, yeah. right now I have these turns oh, also. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I do. That, that Sorry. one that is turned down is uh, that's such a cool posture. Yeah, it was preening itself. So I just kind of did that in the morning more bird notes well what do i have a lot of bird notes mostly just birds so more shrikes and uh, lapwings yes here <laughs> and yeah been nature journaling for over a year now pintails and yeah. uh tritons salamanders i think they are called so, right. yeah real fun but I really love love uh, the start of the summer yeah right i love now. the little snippets and like little windows into the life beautiful little, sorry what little what the little snippets the little insights oh. each one is like a little window into a different moment in the bird's life yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really love the start of the summer everything's starting to bloom and i have a natural meadow uh not far from home and shrikes and falcons and eagles, uh, everything and the warblers are just singing and uh, flying in the sky. So beautiful, beautiful time right now. Oh, that is Thank so you. exciting. Yeah. That is so exciting. Well, happy, happy, happy summertime to you there. Uh, yeah, it's been a long, long winter. All right. Um, so David, I would also like to introduce you to Ray Bonto. Um, he's in London, and um, uh, Ray Bonto, good to see you. Um, you are live with uh, David Lucas. Hi David, um, this was great, and I'd like it to happen again. Uh, so I don't have competition or anything of that sort, but uh, I my focus is mainly on pictures. Um, even if it doesn't have a layout. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> this one, this one, that uh, three-quarter view on that downy woodpecker. Um, 
really good uh, um, angles and observation of the structure in there. Yeah, and I love the playing with the name too. Yes. Capitalizing the letters, that's great. So yeah, he, uh, Ray Bonta sort of is tying into that four letter code. Yes, yep. Nice, nice. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, God, David, so did I tell you this was your community? Gotta hook you up with this community. And oh, and that that lomation there with those those beautiful stripes, that, that stripey top the lomation, and then that uh that, that cool one with the onion-like skin. Mm -hmm. right. oh, um, I don't have much interest in plants, but a lot in live and not live, but animals, insects and stuff. And birds. Fun. Thank you. I love that. Um, yeah. And Bigger than life. Would you like some nature journal pages? Um, yeah, uh, let's let's just see a couple other pages that you've um, been up to and see what has been happening in your nature journal. Uh, so there, yeah. what Ray, uh, Bonto's about to show you, David, is uh, stuff that he does live in the field. Um, that that first page was from the class, but he so he has a, a one notebook for for studying from the class, and then this next one what you're about to see this is this is from the field. And uh, this was a Canada goose and another fox. Um, mm. uh, <laughs> and uh, this was uh, one Canada goose. Mm -hmm. and it was standing quite still, so I did this whole page on it. <laughs> the, the way you're sort of simplifying um, and representing those large masses of feathers, I think, is such an effective way to 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 show the the structure. Um, not putting in every detail, feather, 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 but these feather masses mm -hmm. is really what we see. I also. Um, just uh, artistically, putting dark next to those light places really pops this thing out because there's a dark value next to those places where you put the white in on the body, on the undertail cover, it's by the breast, and on that uh, chin strap. That is, in fact, the background. Uh, yeah. As you can see, it's standing. Uh, that's the water. It's mm -hmm. really standing, staring. And by the way, baby coots have developed quite a lot. Oh, oh, they sure have. They've lost all that that kind of weird red, um, and 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 yellow feather down. Yeah. Yep. And I found a female mallard, um, going round and round the coot's neck, and no coots were there. Huh. I wonder what what's going on <laughs> there. Uh, uh, and then I saw this Egyptian goose. I mean, there was this island and it was far away, but I had my squatting scope and, and a few days ago my tripod arrived. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> yeah, so now you'll just be able to, to put it up and um, you'll be looking through your spotting scope. Um, so the, the, the mechanics uh, of it are you're, you're looking through the scope and then you look down and draw and look up through the scope and look down and draw. It's, there's none of this sort of like this. Now I'm going to have to like pick up my pencil again. But it's this very direct thing. You look, draw, look, draw, look, draw. So sketching through a telescope on a tripod, your, your world is about to change. And I did that for this one. And this is what I got. <sighs> yes. Wow. Yeah. Everybody look at also that uh, that that little enlargement mm -hmm. place. That's a good idea. Uh, I did a double head. Uh, and... Oh, the head is down and resting, and then the head pops up. So everybody see that that the the goose's head wrapped down around the back there, and then. And then it puts the head up. And so you've got both of those positions in one sketch with the same body position. 
And I saw the feather details, so I just put it in a zoom in box. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that we can see that kind of detail through the scope? That's really yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. That's really fun. Yeah. Also, um, I want folks to notice the value range that Ray Bonto is using. Dark's going really to dark, and then uh, light range. So you've got a full range of values from darks to lights in there. That's one thing that really helps those drawings pop off that piece of paper like you're seeing. So get good value range in there like that and you'll be sketching like Ray Bonto. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one suggestion uh, out of topic completely. You can put your telescope, the one for astronomy, but uh, you can put it up in your garden on a Dobsonian mount, if you know what that is. Uh, and you could put a tent around it and you made an observatory. That would be really wow. fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so you. much, Ravonto. It's Thank really you. good to see you. Thank you. Okay. I'm now jumping back to the uh, community cam here. And uh, Oh, Nicholas. Uh, so we've got uh, more goshawks. Uh, Nicholas uh, shared these goshawk adventures with us. Um, um, and uh, Nicholas, are you in Norway, was it? Where, where are you based? Uh, no, I'm in, in New Brunswick now. Uh, in New Brunswick. Eastern okay. part of Canada, yes. Okay. Nice. Yeah, thanks a lot for this fantastic uh, presentation of uh, your little uh, large world and, and beauty. Uh, I I'm really enjoy that. And I was curious to know whether you uh, you had any at-risk species uh, around the area that you can observe uh, regularly and that you can help protect. Uh... What kind of species did you say? Oh, so um, at-risk at species. At-risk species. So species well, special concerned, endangered, or threatened. Yeah. I think there's a variety, yeah. So to document them is what you're saying? Yeah, I wonder if you had uh, the opportunity to see some of them and then maybe some are close by uh, your place and then you you would have the opportunity to maybe see how they are doing. And yeah. So yesterday I walked across the street and I have a bank swallow colony across the street. Nice. And that's the only second time in my life I've gotten to see a bank swallow colony. And they are, I don't know what their official destination is, but I'm sure they're threatened. Um, or species yeah. of concern. And so I filmed that yesterday for this group too, to post that as a video. Um, so uh, other ones here, we have other ones here, but they're all in really remote areas. I mean, like the chances of seeing a lynx or a wolverine that's here is pretty, pretty scarce. We also have three packs of wolves here. So maybe I can see a wolf one day too. And do you know if the uh, the regulation around uh, wolf hunting is is uh, didn't change like uh, in Idaho uh, in your state? In Washington, they're actively trying to introduce them right now. I mean, they're protecting them. They're not trying to open up the hunting, I don't think. But you know, maybe that'll change over time as they become more common. But mm -hmm. great question, you know. And I behind your question is the value of the work we do to help raise awareness and capture images and experiences of, you know, connecting with these animals. And I think that's a really important point to make is how can we do that? And how can we share these images with people? So, you know, the, my long-term goal will be to do that. So for instance, um, it's often hard to see these species. Um, and so you just get little snippets of them, but like I found a coyote pup litter. And I did a, I spent two weeks with a litter of coyote pups and I went every day and filmed them. And I posted that as a video because that's such a rare insight into the lives of an animal that we don't normally see. Um, so I will do that if I have a chance. And in the case of the coyote pups, I got two weeks of amazing footage of the coyote babies playing with each other. And it's just, it's so neat to share that for an animal that people normally hate and misunderstand, to understand how sweet and playful they are when you see them privately like that. Yeah, and it's a very nice opportunity to open the, the world to others and then see that maybe 
things that people are not able to see, for instance, if they live in, in big cities. And that's a very great opportunity. And, and I thank you for that a lot. Thank and, you very uh, much for mentioning that. Yes. Yeah. And I want to just do a note to Jack. It's like if we're the goshawk, when I saw the picture, I was very happy to see it also that you had the chance to see up close. And then the, the one that is living in, in the back of the forest here, uh, I was not able to see it for some time, but two days ago, I, I went back to that place and uh, he was going mad at something. And uh, I didn't see clearly, but just a shadow over the tops of the trees. And he was really uh, in full uh, blast attack. So um, maybe the, the nest is not far, but I didn't see it yet, but uh, I hope to see it before they're, they are fledging away or from it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. What a neat thing to pay attention to. Yeah. And, and uh, folks, you. another thing to look forward to, uh, we are going to be having a special Nature Journal Club workshop uh, where we'll be joining Nicholas on some of his Arctic research expeditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that'll be something to, to look forward to. So looking forward to, 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 yes. to that. Thank you so much, Nicholas. You it is really good to see you. Thank you to you too. Thank you. Um, now bouncing back to the gallery here. Um, <clears throat> so in just a moment, I am going to be turning off um, the uh, recording. If somebody would like to share, but they didn't feel comfortable doing that, when the recording was on, you will have an uh, an opportunity to do that then. Um, everybody, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, I want to express my, my deep gratitude and appreciation to uh, David Lucas for uh, coming out here and, and sharing his insights about nature, observations that he's made, and just a little bit of the reasons why uh, he loves this planet so much. I think you folks got a little bit of a sense today of uh, just how much fun it is to, to hang out with, with David. Um, uh, he and I will be in discussions about uh, uh, ways of, it sounds like looking, it looks to me like looking at the, the, the chat and comments that there would be a lot of interest from people in how to connect with you on a more regular basis. And um, so, David had a whole set of slides prepared. We got through part of his introduction. <laughs> yeah. We got through part of the introduction. And that's how much fun we had, right? So this was just geeking out with the, the like in the, the, the introduction to, 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 to David's um, program here. Um, there's a lot more that we could play with. So um, we'll look forward to that. Again, Great. David, thank you. Deep respect and gratitude. Thank you so much, everyone.